open your books, if you have the second edition, um, to page 686. <clears throat> if you have the first edition, I have no idea which page you're on. We're looking for Good Friday, 1613, writing westward. <clears throat> Say that again? 673 in the first edition. And if we have time, if we finish um, what I've got on the syllabus for today for Dunn and Johnson, then we might go back and look at at least a couple of the holy sonnets have done, um, and maybe one other thing. But that's a big if. Okay, Good Friday, 1613, writing westward. This is one of the few poems written by Dunn that we do actually know the date. Okay? Um, and by that I mean many of the manuscripts actually do have this title. Almost all of Dunn's other poems have no titles okay, in the manuscript tradition. And I think I've mentioned in here before, um, Dunn is, is one of the authors or the author for whom we have the most manuscript evidence in uh, the early 17th century, the late 16th century. And what I mean by that in terms of <coughs> manuscript evidence is that his roughly 210 poems that he wrote survive in over 5,000 copies. People were copying Dunn left and right. right? Um, one of his poems, I don't think it's in here. Uh, it's one of his elegies titled The Anagram. Yeah, it's not in here. Um, survives in 85 copies. It's really, really popular in the 18th century, uh, 17th century, excuse me. Okay, But Good Friday 1613 is one of the few poems that does actually um, have a title. Almost all of these other titles, take it back, all of these other titles that you see for Dunn's poems in here, except for the first anniversary because Dunn actually published that himself, all these other titles are titles made up by editors. Because in the manuscripts, in the copies that survive, few of them actually had um, titles by Dunn. And only one poem survives in Dunn's own handwriting, by the way. So the three Manuscript, those are, those are titles given to them by editors. Now, some of those editors, let me clarify this, some of those editors are contemporaneous with Dunn. For example, you'll see after the um, after many of the poems, you'll see the date 1633. Okay, that's referring to the first printed edition of Dunn's poetry, two years after he died. All right, the editor of that collection of poetry probably knew Dunn, but the editor provides titles. In many of the manuscripts, there are titles for the poems, but we don't know that those titles are Dunn's titles. Again, because we only have one poem that survives in Dunn's own handwriting. Similarly, you know, like with Shakespeare. We don't have any poems, any of the sonnets that survive in Shakespeare's handwriting. We don't have any of the plays that survive in Shakespeare's own handwriting. Okay. We do have some copies of other plays that Shakespeare apparently helped work on. Okay? And this is some of the evidence that people adduce to say, oh, well, Shakespeare wasn't really Shakespeare, etc. Which what is complete is nonsense. What point is that? Um, it's, a, it's a verse letter to the Lady Carrie and Mrs. Essex Rich. So was this a, a, a personal letter? Yes. But it's, it's called a verse letter because, it, I mean, it literally looks just like, what is this? This is junk. Um, it's a folded sheet like this. It's folded three times. And on the outside, it has an address to Lady Carrie and Essex Rich. 
And then you open it up, and it's a poem. But it's a letter. Okay? This was very common for people to write letters to somebody else and put it in the form of a poem. But that's the only thing in Dunn's own hand um, that survives. Right? Kind of interesting. You can view it on, uh, it's available online. <clears throat> so, Good Friday, 1613, writing westward. Now, 1613 is before Dunn takes holy orders. Okay? That is, he becomes a priest in the Anglican Church in 1615. But something in between, when he gets married in 1601, and, well, let's just be precise. In 1615, something changes in the way Dunn views religion, God, the church, etc. Because it's still possible that as of 1601, Dunn may be quasi-Catholic. Okay? He wouldn't be out and out openly Catholic because that would be dangerous when Queen Elizabeth was still alive. Okay? But by 1615, he's definitely Anglican. He belongs to the Church of England. He takes holy orders. He becomes of the Church of England. Okay? Now, a lot of people argue that the Holy Sonnets, which we might talk a little bit about, are probably somewhere in this period, 1608 to 1611, and that the Holy Sonnets reflect Dunn's inner turmoil about God, and, and thus that they're kind of reflecting this transformation in Maybe, maybe not. Okay. Um, one of the reasons I say maybe, maybe not, I worked on Dunn's Holy Sonnets for my uh, dissertation. I edited them for an edition. Um, is that in the early 1590s, Dunn writes Satire 3, which is in your book, which I really encourage you to read, which is all about religion. And in Satire 3, he essentially says, how do we know what is the real church? Is it the one in Geneva? That is Calvinism. Okay. Is it Luther's? Is it here in England? Or is it off in Rome? So is it the Catholic Church? Is it the Anglican Church? Is it the Lutheran Church? Or is it the Presbyterian Reformed Church? I don't know. Seek it out is essentially what he says. Okay. But this is in the early 1590s. Okay. You, you see and done that here's somebody who's asking a lot of questions. Uh, and you'll see if you read Satire 3, he's not necessarily asking easy questions. And he, nor is he looking for easy answers. So, Good Friday, 1613. Ten minutes later. <laughs> Let man's soul be a sphere. And then in this, the intelligence that moves, devotion is. Remember the other day we talked about the Ptolemaic system of the universe? Okay, which then Earth's at the center, and then you have the nine concentric spheres. Okay, notice he uses the same image, but he's not talking about the universe now. Now he's saying, let man's soul be a sphere, okay, and let devotion be intelligence. Because in the Christianized form of this system of understanding the universe, each one of these spheres has an angelic being that rules it. Earth has an angelic being that rules it. His name is Satan. Okay? If you're familiar with C.S. Lewis's space trilogy, he's the bent one. And that's why he's a silent planet, because he doesn't communicate with all the other good angels and such. So, let man's soul be a sphere, and then in this, the intelligence that moves devotion is. And when he says let... He's telling the reader, allow, that is, walk with me for a moment. Let's play this thought experiment. Okay? And as the other spheres, by being grown subject to foreign motions, lose their own, what he means by that is, in this understanding of the universe, each one of these spheres moves, and their movement affects the sphere beneath it. Right? It's the whole principle behind astrology. 
So, as the other spheres, by being grown subject to foreign motions, lose their own, and being by others buried every day, scarce in a year their natural form obey. What's he getting at? Clearly, there's one sphere, two, three, four, and you can go on out. What he's suggesting is, let's say this is A, B, C. Okay? C affects B, B affects A, so C also affects A. A's natural movement, that is, what it would do on its own, therefore, has what happened to it? It's changed. Okay? It's changed. Notice in the version we have, we get a colon after obey. What usually does that mean? Hang on along, and you make a statement, and then you have a colon. What comes after the colon? One at a time. A list? What else? What can the material after the colon serve for the material before? It can help explain it. Okay? So, pleasure or business, so our souls admit for their first mover and are world by it. Okay? First mover in this Ptolemaic system is God. Aristotle defines God as the prime mover. Prime meaning first. Right? Because nothing's behind God. Nothing moves God. Right? So, what is he saying? If our souls be a sphere, what moves our sphere? What's the prime directive for you Star Trek fans? God. Is it God? Yes. No. <coughs> Pleasure or business, he says, is what moves us. And I'll just take a moment and think about that. Correct or incorrect? I bet a whole lot of people would say, yeah, pleasure is what moves me. You know, we even have a motto, if it feels good, do it. Or, we have another model, just do it, okay? And if it's not that, then it is make as much money as you can, because he who dies with the most toys wins. It's not any different today than it was in 1610. So, hence is it, hence, therefore, is it, that I am carried towards the west this day when my soul's form bends towards the east. Okay. West, east. What day is it? It's Good Friday. What's happening? Christ is dying. Christ is on the cross. And metaphorically, Christ is on the cross every Good Friday. It's not just one thing that happened in Dunsday, 1,600 years ago. Okay? So, he says, here's John Dunn. Okay, I'll put him on a horse. He's got two legs. Horse, head, ear, ears. Big one else. Okay. <laughs> and what? He's facing the west. But his soul's form. What does he mean by his soul's form? His body, his will. He's using form, I think, in the Platonic sense. You guys all familiar with Plato? Not Plato, Plato. Okay? <laughs> Two different things. One squishy and malleable, and you can make stuff with it, and the other one is not, obviously. Okay? Plato held that there is a world of forms, a world of universals. And that world is what was real. Everything we see around us, 
This is a mere imitation. In other words, if you really take Plato seriously, this isn't the real Brian Struble. He Brian's eyes get really big. Like, What's he doing? Okay. This is a copy. This isn't a real bottle. This has characteristics of a bottle, but it doesn't have ultimate bottleness. The real bottle in the world of forms has all the characteristics of bottleness in it. Because how is this bottle different from, say, Connie's bottle? They're both bottles, right? But they're different. Well, how can they be different and yet the same? So what is a characteristic of bottleness? They hold something. They hold something inside of them. Does it have to be water? No. What else? They have a lid. Do they have a lid? Probably. Does it have to be a pop-top lid or screw-off lid? Doesn't matter. Okay. Does it have to be tall and narrow? No. Have you ever seen fat, wide bottles, wide mouth jars, you know, so to speak? I was going to say, when does a bottle become a jar? When does a bottle become a jar? Man, that is an existential question that just... <laughs> Glass bottle? Plastic bottle? Environmentally good, I guess. You know, meanwhile, you know, <laughs> so, he's heading towards the west, but his soul's form does what? Look wide. Because his soul's form, the source of the soul, is hanging on the cross. Okay? There, well, Becca, why is it he's heading west? Probably business. Pleasure or business. Okay. There I should see a sun by rising set, and by that setting endless day beget. There where? Not over here. Here. In the east you would see a sun by rising set. The sun rising on the cross, and in the manuscripts, in some of the manuscripts, the pun is lost on the part of the copyists because they don't write S-U-N. They write S-O-N. They want to make it crystal clear for my dummy readers, I'm talking about Jesus. Okay? Dunn doesn't want to do that, however. Dunn wants you to work a little bit. Okay? But that Christ on this cross did rise and fall, sin had eternal. Okay. Christ, the Son, if he hadn't risen and fallen on that cross, notice what he says. Sin would have made everything night. What? You know, in Britain, they still use a phrase, even today, in 2013, that when somebody's getting ready to die, they're going west. They don't mean they're heading off to Cornwall. <laughs> they're going west. Okay. It's probably what's meant, by the way, that Art went to Avalon. He went west. So, yet dare I almost be glad I do not see that spectacle of too much weight for me. Christ hanging on the cross. Now, bear in mind... For example, like in Greek drama, you never saw a spectacle. That is, when Oedipus puts his eyes out, or when Yocasta kills herself, happens off stage. You never see anything like that, because it's too horrific. Right? Dunn here is saying, or the I'm almost, notice, not necessarily am glad, I'm almost glad that I don't see why, because he's facing the rest His back is to the cross. And he explains what that means. Who face that is self-life must die. Why? 
Well, because God told Moses, no man can see me and live. Okay? What a death were it then to see God die? That is, if no man can see God's face, then what would it be to see God's death? Because the person hanging on the cross is both fully God, fully man. It made his own lieutenant, nature, shrink. The earthquake at the crucifixion. The footstool crack and the sun wink. The eclipse or the darkened sky. Could I behold those hands which span the poles? What does he mean, which span the poles? Okay. He does mean span these poles. But he also means north and south. You're all familiar with that image. Whether you know it or not, you've seen it. That image by Michelangelo, uh, Leonardo da Vinci. That naked guy standing like this with his arms held out like that. And a circle drawn all the way around with the words, all things. All right? Could I behold those hands which span the poles and tune all spheres at once? Why do they tune all spheres at once? Because he's the first mover. He's the great sphere tuner, piano tuner of the world. Pierced with those holes, the holes in the hands. Could I behold that endless height which is zenith to us? Antipodes, not antipodes, antipodes. Okay. Humbled below us. What does he mean? That greatest, that zenith. God. God is so far, so high above us as anything. Is now what? Humbled below us. Right? What is meant by the antipodes are the two poles, north and south. In the medieval conception, okay, you have the world essentially divided into three areas. Okay? You have the northern antipodes, and you have the antipodes, and nobody lives in these areas. It was sucked. This is the habitable zone. Okay? Nobody lives here. But at the South Pole, only the fools, <laughs> scientists live there. Uh, it's possible, it's more than likely, however, that this notion is what gives rise to this idea, that this is the middle of Earth. Uh, not the Tolkien. <laughs> the word that's used in Middle English, and even Old English. Midyard. Okay. Middle yard. That's what that word actually means. You also see then in Norse, Midgard. Same thing. The middle earth. Right? So it's the idea that there's an earth above and an earth below. That, however, isn't necessarily the antipodes. That's this idea. We're here, and then there's another realm below us, not topographically or geographically below. And then there's another realm that's... Um, above. So, how can we see this thing humbled below us? Or that blood which is the seat of all our souls, changed by the seat is the origin. Some of the manuscripts read state of all our souls. If it weren't for his blood, our blood wouldn't be important at all. So, if not of his made dirt of dust or that flesh which was worn by God for his apparel, ragged and torn. Now, you have to go back to what's the verb that's governing all of this. Could I behold? Could I behold that blood of all our souls? Well, what's he mean? If I look to the cross, what does he see? Do you see the namby-pamby, pasty-white 
wasp Jesus hanging there with the nice little white towel around his middle area so nobody sees him naked. And he looks clean? No. Because, you, you know, put yourself into the situation. He walks from Jerusalem to Golgotha, and he's carrying the cross. He stumbles so that Simon of Cyrene has to come, you know, pick up the cross and stuff. Well, what happens when he stumbles? Falls in the dirt. We're not talking paved roads. So when he stumbles and he's all covered with sweat and blood because he's been scourged, not Mel Gibson's scourging, because nobody would live through that. Okay? But he would be beaten, he would be bad, he would be bloody. He then gets up, and now he's got all this dirt and dust, plus there's people all along the way. And they're not just standing still. So dust is being kicked up. Okay? That's what he's getting at. So he sees this blood, and it made dirt and dust. What's the difference between dirt and dust? Okay, is it really? It's more wet than dust. What do you really mean, however? Say it again. It's more compounded. Dirt, like snow, what can you do with wet snow that you can't do with powdery snow? Powdery snow just really sucks for making a snowball. Because you, you throw it and it just, you know. Good wet snow, however, you can compact to an ice ball. Okay? Dirt. <laughs> You can compact and make things out of. Dust, it just stays dust, right? So, his blood, dirt, of, or that flesh, which was worn by God for his Put it on like we put on clothes. Ragged and torn. Crown of thorns, you know, all that stuff. If on these things I durst not look. Why? Because he's heading west. For what reasons? Business or pleasure? Sorry, God, I'm too busy. Or, sorry, God, time to go have fun. If on these things I durst not look. On his miserable mother cast mine eye. Maybe I don't want to look at the cross because that's too much. Can I look at Mary? He's there who was God's partner here. Partner. Partner is a euphemism today, right? What does it mean? Today, it means significant other. Okay? Husband, wife. Mary was God's wife here. Well, not literally. But what does he mean? There'd be no person hanging on the cross. Were it not for Mary saying, be it done to me according to, as you have said. In other words, if Mary when she came and said, here's what's going to happen. The Holy Ghost is going to come upon you. You're going to conceive. The thing you're going to have will be called. And she, no, I don't really think so. I, I don't really like that idea. Then it never would have happened. Okay, That's why he says, um, his miserable mother, who is God's partner here, and furnished us half of that sacrifice which ransomed us. Well, which half? Top half, bottom half. Left half, right half. The human half. The human half. Okay. Which ransomed us. Without that, the payment couldn't be made. Okay? Those things as I ride be from mine eye. Why? Because he's facing west. They are present yet unto my memory. Not because he was physically there, but because he's learned about them. He knows about them. So as he's riding west and he's turning his back on God, he's thinking for that which looks toward them, they are present yet unto my memory. For that, the memory, looks and thou looks towards me, O Savior. Christ is hanging there on the cross, the speaker says, and I'm riding away from you. I've turned my back to you. What does it mean when anybody turns your back to you? It's disrespect. 
You know, you ask somebody a question and they turn the other way. It's essentially F you. Okay? So, turning his back to God hanging on the cross, is he saying, I'm too busy for this. But thou looks towards me as thou hangst upon the tree. I turn my back to thee. Oh, but I'm giving a reason why. To receive corrections till thy mercies bid thee leave. What does he mean to receive corrections? Scourge me. Beat me. Okay? Think me worth thine anger. Is he some kind of masochist? No. So what does he mean? Think me worth thine anger. What is the speaker suggesting? I'm not. <laughs> I'm not worth God's anger. I'm not worth God's time. Maybe Brian is. Maybe Madeline is. Maybe Jacqueline. But I'm not. This is doubt on the speaker's part. Okay? Think me, punish me, burn off my rusts and my deformity. My, you know, restore the image. The image of you in me. So much by thy grace that thou mayst know me and I'll turn my face. So as he's writing was, and this is a good image there for he's saying, make this what it ought to be. Make this really reflect the image of God. You do that, and then what? Turn around and face him. But notice how the poem ends. Does the speaker turn around and face God? No. Why not? Because the image isn't restored. The speaker is still somewhat in doubt. Okay, God, are you going to do this in me? Why? Because the speaker is thoroughly Calvinist. The speaker can't do anything on his own. It's the whole, I was using this the other day in another class, the whole Calvinist system of theology. Any of you familiar with this? Nobody? It's a flower that grows every spring. No, it's not. It's called the five points of Calvinism. Total depravity of man. What does that mean? It means there's nothing you can do. There's nothing in you that is not touched by sin. Okay? So, you're being Mother Teresa and helping the untouchables in Calcutta. It's sin. She's doing that because she feels guilty or something. Okay? You're helping a little old lady. You're working at a soup line or whatever. All of it touched by sin. Nothing you do is good. Or nothing you can do is out of the good of your heart. Exactly. Okay? Two... Or you, you, un, unconditional election. Okay? What does this mean? It means God chooses who will be saved, period. Doesn't have anything to do with what that individual does. Largely because that decision, that election is made before that person even lives. So, before God creates anything in his foreknowledge, he says, Connie will be saved, Shiloh will be saved, and because he spoke up, Jason will be saved. The rest of you go to hell. Okay? Because according to Calvin, according to Calvin, the vast majority of humanity is damned. Okay? The non elect are few, according to Calvin. Right? L. Limited atonement. Christ only died for the elect. Those who were predestined by God, 
to be saved are those whom Christ dies for. Therefore, when it says that God wills that no man go to hell, that no man die, not really. That just, you know, that's said to kind of make us feel better. <laughs> or when it says, you know, Christ died, no, not really. He only died for the elect. I, irresistible, irresistible grace. If you are one of the elect, then God showers his grace upon you, and you cannot. Okay? No matter what you do, you can't say no to God. P, perseverance of the And I'm getting looks from some of you. Yes, I know this is an oversimplification. Okay. Um, I used to be a true blue believer in all. Nickname in college was TR, truly reformed. I mean, chapter and verse and everything. Perseverance of the saints. If you are one of the elect, grace has been showered upon you. No matter what comes, you will persevere to the very end. You will die with compasses on your lips. You will not go, oh yeah, God, well. Example I used in class the other day, you know, if Billy Graham on deathbed were to say, F you, God, then that would show that Billy Graham was never one of the elect. He was never really a Christian. Because he didn't show perseverance. Okay? So this melody is, ki is kind of behind some of what Dunn writes in here. I'm not saying Dunn is a Calvinist. Because it's pretty clear to me from some of his other poems and a lot of his sermons, Dunn is not a Calvinist. All right? Dunn thinks there is good in you, Father. I can feel it yet. Right? That that people can act upon that. Well, poor Madeline, I blew her mind. <laughs> right? Mix those metaphors. So restore thine image, and by your grace, he says, I'll be redeemed. Right? Turn from there. This one has even more depth. The hymn to God the Father. Right? Hymn to God the Father was written when Dunn was sick in 1623. The next thing we're going to read from the devotions, Meditation 17, okay, was written when Dunn was ill. He thought he was on his deathbed. And he wrote this poem, Hymn to God the Father. And then it was later set to music, and he had the choir at St. Paul's Cathedral sing it repeatedly. You know, during church services. Wilt thou forgive that sin where I begun, which is my sin, though it was before? Wilt thou forgive those sins through which I run, and do them still, though still I do deplore? When thou hast done, thou hast not done, for I have more. Wilt thou forgive that sin which I have won others to sin? And made my sin their door. Wilt thou forgive that sin which I did shun a year or two, but wallowed in a score? When thou hast done, thou hast not done, for I have more. I have a sin of fear, that when I have spun my last thread, I shall perish on the shore. But swear by thyself that at my death thy sun shall shine as he shines now and heretofore. And having done that, thou hast done, I have no more. Go back to the first two lines. What is that sin where I begun, which is my sin, though it were done before? Original sin. Okay? Which, being a good Western Christian, okay, European Christian, Dunn would be thoroughly knowledgeable about. And because of his interest in theology, because we know he read a lot of theology, he would completely know that this idea or doctrine 
of original sin okay, came from St. Augustine. St. Augustine, Bishop of Hippo in the 6th century, 5th and 6th century. St. Augustine taught after Adam and Eve, everyone who is born is born guilty of the sin of Adam and Eve. Okay? So if any of you get married and you have a little bundle of joy, and you first look at that little bundle of joy, that little bundle of joy, according to St. Augustine, is damned to hell. Unless and until that little bundle of joy is baptized. If that child dies before baptism, that child goes to hell. All right? There's a doctrine of the medieval church. The church today no longer really teaches that. The church does teach that the child doesn't go to heaven, but it goes to a place, you know, think Dante, nine circles of hell. It's up there on the outermost level of hell, kind of looking to heaven. It's not so bad there. It's not hellfire, burning damnation, and such. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Talking about Catholicism. Okay. This, this all comes from St. Augustine. Now, John Calvin drank that hook, line, and sinker. Believed it all. Okay. So this informs really all of Western theology. It informs the church, it informs Protestant theology, Whatever branch of Protestant, you know, church you're in, this is part of it. Not necessarily the part about babies being damned to hell, but the idea of original sin is. That is, that we are guilty at birth. All right? That's what he's talking about. Notice, it's my sin. Why? Because I will do the same thing. According to this doctrine... This propensity to sin is ingrained. It's genetically passed on. All right? So, wilt thou forgive those sins through which I run and do them still, though still I do deplore? That is, those sins that I still do every day, even though I don't want to. When thou hast done, that is, when you have forgiven those sins, thou hast not done. Notice the pun. When you've done that, you don't have, in some, several of the manuscripts, read, thou hast not done. You don't have me. Why? I've got more. Okay? Kind of like he's saying, I've just walked away from confession, and I immediately, boom, sin again in my mind. So we get stanza two. Well, okay, now keep in mind, when he composes this, he thinks he's dying. He thinks he's on his deathbed. Wilt thou forgive that sin which I have others to sin? No longer just some little merely personal sin, but the sin I've used to attract others to sinning also and made my sin their door, their opening into darkness. Wilt thou forgive that sin which I did shun a year or two, but wallowed in a score? I shunned it for a little bit, but I wallowed in it. Define wallow. Like a pig in mud. Perfect example. Okay. So what kind of sin do you wallow in? Bingo. Sex. That's what it's talking about. Just complete down and out, dirty, raunchy sex. Okay? When thou hast done, thou hast not done. Why? Because I ain't giving it up yet. I have a sin of fear. Fear. That when I have spun my last thread, I'll perish on the shore. What shore? On the far side of Jordan. See, that whole image of the River Jordan is it's a demarcation. 
You don't want to die on the far side of Jordan. You want to cross over Jordan into the promised land. Okay? Moses died on the far side. Joshua and the rest of the Israelites got to come into the promised land. So notice what he says. Here's my fear. I'm not going to make it. Don did not have what a lot of Protestant groups today call assurance. He wasn't assured of salvation. Okay? He doubted his own salvation. So, swear by yourself that at my death thy son shall shine as he shines now and here to... Okay, God, you swear to me, you promise to me that when I die will shine as he shines now and as he has shown up until now. Well, why does he use that language, shine? Because there's an Old Testament blessing. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. Why? Because it's when God turns his back to somebody, all hell breaks loose. It's when God turns his back on the nation of Israel that Israel falls to pot. Okay? So, having done that, having done what? You make that promise to me. Then hast done. I have no more. Why? Because he's saying, if at the moment when I die, okay, or let me back up, if you promise now that at the moment when I die, your sun will shine on me as he shines now, then I'm fine. Because he's not saying I don't have any more sins now. He's saying at that moment, I won't have any more sins. But what about between now and then? Okay. This is where there's doubt. And Dunn writes a lot about death. Because he doubted what would happen. He also wrote a manual on death. He wrote a book called Beathanatos. After he became a priest... Bia means self. Thanatos means death. Suicide. He wrote a book arguing for suicide after he became a priest. Now, most church people say, no, that's not a good thing to do. But he wrote it in Greek. A lot of people can't read Greek. Right? Sneaky little bugger. Okay, uh, Meditation 17. Now these devotions, your footnote tells you these were written during his convalescence from a dangerous illness. And they consist of 23 stations, each consisting of a meditation, an expostulation, and a concluding prayer. Okay. Um, what we have here is the meditation from number 17. We'll probably take the rest of the period just for this. One. <sighs> Hope not. So, perchance he for whom this bell tolls may be so ill as that he knows not it tolls for him. And perchance I may think myself so much better than I am as that they who are about me and see my state may have caused it to toll for me and I know not that little bit of context. He's talking about this British custom of when somebody dies, you ring the church bell for them. If it's a man, you ring the bell nine times. If it's a woman, you ring the bell eight times. Until you hear boom, 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 eight or nine times. Then there'd be a pause, and then the bell would ring again for each of the years that the person lived. So if you hear nine bells, space, 21 bells, a 21-year-old male somewhere in the vicinity had died. Okay? And what he's talking about here is at this time in late 1623, early 1624, London, okay, around, and a lot of people were dying. And so 
he's convalescing and he hears the bell ringing and says, maybe the person for whom the bell is ringing doesn't know that it's ringing. And maybe I may think myself so much better than I am as that they who are about me and see my state may have caused it to toll for me. The people sitting around bed know I'm dying. And so they've already begun the bell ringing. The church is Catholic. Universal. Universal redefining Catholic. So are all her actions. All that she does belongs to all. Well, what does he mean by that? The church is ringing the bell. So the ringing of the bell applies to everyone, the living and the dead. When she baptizes the child, that action concerns me. For that child is thereby connected to that body which is my head too, and engrafted into that body whereof I am a member. And when she buries a man, that action concerns me. All mankind is of one author and is one volume. Dunn loves this imagery or this metaphor of mankind as being a library of books. When one man dies, one chapter is not torn out of the book. Better language. And every chapter must be so translated. Notice, every chapter. Not some chapters, not a few number of chapters, every chapter. Okay? God employs several translators. Some pieces are translated by age, some by sickness, some by war, some by justice. But God's hand is in every translation. And his hand shall bind up all our scattered leaves again, for that library where every book shall lie open to one another. No matter how you die, Dunn is writing, God is involved. You might be some junkie under a bridge and you OD. He's saying, God is there. God is involved in that. Okay? So, every book will lie open in this great library. What does that mean? Anyone can read it. What else does it mean? It's still being written. Okay. Now it's still being written. Then it won't be. There won't be any secrets. There won't be any secrets. In other words, we will know each other perfectly, entirely. There won't be any secrets kept. So, As therefore the bell that rings to a sermon calls not upon the preacher only, but upon the congregation to come, so this bell calls us all. But how much more me, who am brought so near the door of this sickness? It calls all of us, he says. But it calls me more particularly. Why? Because I'm almost dead. There was a contention as far as a suit in which both piety, dignity, religion, and estimation were mingled, which of the religious orders should ring to prayers first in the morning? And it was determined, duh, they should ring first that rose earliest. If we understand aright the dignity of this bell, that is, the significance of this bell that tolls for our evening prayer, we would be glad to make it ours by rising early. Okay. Notice what he's saying the bell is doing that is now ringing for somebody who's died. It's the bell ringing, telling the parishioners, it's time to come to Vespers. Getting ready to start the service. And so he says, if we really understood the dignity of what this bell means, we would get up early in the morning. Why? To be ready. The bell doth toll for him that thinks it doth. And though it intermit again, that is, it pauses, Yet from that minute that that occasion wrought upon him, he is united to God. The bell doth ring for him that doth think it doth. What does that mean? If you take the significance of that bell ringing, okay, 
and you apply it to yourself, then he says, the bell is ringing for you. And what has that done? It is you. Because if you take the significance of the bell, what's the bell saying? Death. 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 And it makes you think of God. So, who casts not up his eye to the sun when it rises? Everybody, if they're awake and they see the sunrise, they stop and look at it. Who takes his eye off from a comet when that breaks out? Who bends not his ear to any bell which upon any occasion rings? And I bet you if somebody's cell phone went off right now, everybody would turn and look. But who can remove it from that? which is passing a piece of himself out of this world. What does he mean, passing a piece of himself out of this world? If the bell is tolling for someone who has died, then that person who has died is part of you. Not literally, but he's part or she is part of you. How? They are the same as you. Human nature. A little bit of human nature is gone. No man is entire of itself. Notwithstanding Simon and Garfunkel singing, I am an island. I am a rock. Okay? The poem's based on this, by the way. Their song is. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, as well as if a manner of thy friends or of thine own were. Colon. Any man's death diminishes me. Well, what does that really mean? Every man's death diminishes me, makes me less. Why? Because I am involved in mankind. Involved. Tied to. Part of mankind. Therefore, never send to know for whom the bells tolls. It tolls for thee. It might be John Smith on the next street over who has actually just died. But Dunn says, don't ask whether the bell is tolling for John Smith. Because if John Smith has died, then a little bit of you has died. A little bit of me has died. This is why Jacob Marley, when he comes to Scrooge, and he's talking, and Scrooge says, man, you are Jacob Marley rattles his chains and says what? Man kind of was my business. Because what did he think about mankind during his life? Screw him. He was there for one reason. To make money. Okay? Neither can we call it of misery or borrowing of misery as though we were not miserable enough of ourselves but must fetch in more from the next house and taking upon us the it's almost like he's saying, don't tell me I'm being all morbid and everything, you know, trying to create misery where there isn't any. He says, no. It were an excusable covetousness if we did. Why? Affliction is a treasure. Okay, pause for a moment. How many of you think affliction is a treasure? I'm standing up here teaching, and my stomach is just all tied up in knots for some reason. And painful. Does that mean I'm going, oh, yeah, this is a treasure. This is really good. No, I'm thinking, I would really rather not be here. What does he mean, affliction is a treasure? Think of the guy, Jeff Bowman, you know, the Boston, at the Boston Merit, that, that iconic picture of the guy being rushed away in the wheelchair with no lower legs. Okay. You think he's thinking today, well, this is the best thing in the world that could have happened to me. I'm so rich. Because I no longer have legs below the knees. 
So what does he mean? Okay. Affliction is a treasure, and scarce any man hath enough of it. Well, think of the Richard family, whose eight-year-old son, Martin, got blown to bits by the bomb. You think they don't have enough affliction? If a man carry treasure in bullion or a wedge of gold and have none coined into current money, not to frame as he travels. Tribulation is treasure in the nature of it. That is, tribulation bullion in the nature of it. But it is not current money in the use of it. If you go to Walmart and you want to buy something and you walk in with a block of gold, how are they going to enter that in the register? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if I were to check out, I'd say, yeah, you can buy that. Just hand it over. I'd be out the door, you know. Okay. So what do you have to do? You have to turn the treasure into currency. It has to be minted, in other words. So how do we do that? Except we get nearer and nearer our home, heaven by it. That is, we get nearer and nearer to heaven, how? Through affliction. Another man may be sick too, and sick to death. And this affliction may lie in his bowels, in a mine. Wish he hadn't used that word, bowels. And be of no use to him. <laughs> but this bell, ding, 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 that tells me of his affliction, digs out and applies that gold to me. How does it apply it? Because it makes Dunn think. John Smith may be over there dying, but John Smith may not be aware of it. And John Smith may be kicking and screaming and railing against God. But me, John Dunn, I know it's preparing me. It's helping me to get ready to meet my maker. If by this consideration of another's danger I take mine own into contemplation and so secure myself by making my recourse to my God who is our only security. Because what do people place a lot of security in? Their bank accounts. Their money. Okay? And yet, do we know, can happen to bank accounts. <laughs> Think, you know, the Great Depression. Think even 2008, if you want. What can happen to all those great stock portfolios? It's merely electronic money. It's money. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. <laughs> boom, boom. Okay? Whoever that Lord is, J.P. Morgan, City. No, the tribulation reminds him that he is dying, that he too will die. So it helps prepare him for death. And the preparation is the turning of the tribulation, the bullion, into $100 bills. The $100 bills, the preparation, the being ready for death, the securing myself to God, the language he uses there. Okay? Okay, go to um, Ben Johnson, who is just before done, if I remember right. And I've only got three things by Johnson. Read the introduction in the second edition, 580. Which one are we doing first? On my first daughter. Uh, 585. And the other edition is 532. 532 or 585? 572. 572 or 585. Okay. Ben Johnson's On My First Daughter. Um, Johnson, um, Johnson was the son of a bricklayer. Okay, which means essentially 
lower middle class. But he went to one of the best schools in London. Went to the, the best school in London. The Westminster School. And became probably the best classicist of his age. Really knew Greek and Latin forwards and backwards. Okay? Which is important because he's going to say something about Shakespeare and Shakespeare's knowledge of Greek, Greek and Latin. But this poem he's writing about his daughter, about her death. Here lies to each her parents, Ruth, Mary, the daughter of their youth. Yet all heaven's gifts being heaven's due, it makes the father less to rue. At six months in, she parted hence with safety of her innocence, whose soul, heaven's queen, whose name she bears, in comfort of her mother's tears, hath placed amongst her virgin train. Where, while that severed doth remain, this grave partakes the fleshly birth, which cover lightly gentle earth. So how old was little Mary when she died? Six months. Okay. The daughter of their youth. Parents were young when they had her. Yet all heaven's gifts being heaven's due. What does that mean? Heaven owns them. Job, the passage I alluded to earlier, says, when word comes to him that his children are wiped out, they're all dead. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Sometimes I know how Job felt when he said that, you know, when I kind of wish my kids would just... Okay. Heaven's gifts, heaven's due. What kind of gifts are heaven's gifts? Think of that word that we saw in Old English. It's not a permanent gift. Okay? So Mary wasn't a permanent gift. It makes the father less to rue, that is, less to sorrow. At six months in, she parted hence with safety of her innocence. Why? Johnson was a Catholic. Okay. She was baptized. Why else? Even in Catholic doctrine, you're baptized and everything, usually within a few days after birth. But you still haven't reached what's called the age of accountability. That is, you're not really ontologically responsible for your sins until you can arrive at the point in your mind where you can say, you know, I'm going to do this. And I know it's wrong, and I know it's bad, and I know it's sinful. What the hell if I do it? But I'm going to do it anyways. Isn't that the age of seven? Okay. It depends. Usually, yeah, it's around seven. Sometimes it gets moved around a little bit. I don't know. I've known two-year-olds who I think, you know, can understand that. And, Mine, you know. <laughs> my toy. You know, beating their little brother or something. <clears throat> Sticking the dog's tail in a fan, you know. Um, whose soul, heaven's queen, whose name she bears. That's an indication of his Catholicism, by the way. Protestants do not refer to Mary as heaven's queen. In comfort of her mother's tears, has placed amongst her virgin train. That is, Mary, the queen of heaven, puts little Mary among her virgin train. Not, woo -woo, ch -ch -ch, not that kind of train. The following virgins yeah. behind her, okay? Where, while that severed doth remain. Well, what severed? Her soul severed from her body. Her soul remains in heaven. Her body remains down earth, down here on earth. Which is why he says, this grave partakes the fleshly birth. Cover lightly, gentle earth. Well, okay. Why cover lightly? Make it easier for the body to be resurrected? Possibly. He doesn't want to think of his daughter being crushed down underneath six feet of dirt. Probably more so that. Okay. On my first son. Notice the little poem to done, by the way, in between the two. So, on my first son. Written in 1603. Farewell, thou child of my right hand. 
The gloss tells you what does it mean. It means Benjamin. His son was named Benjamin. For well, thou child of my right hand, enjoy. I see too much hope of thee, loved boy. Seven years thou wert lent to me, and I thee pay. I just wish I'd have some student use that word, wert. It's a wonderful word. Seven years thou wert lent to me, and I thee pay, exacted by thy fate on thee just day. Could I lose all? Exclamation. What does that mean? Is he saying, it would be better if I'd never been a father? Well, wouldn't, wouldn't he have suffered? The loss of a son. For why will man lament the state he should envy? Why would he lament fatherhood? And that's a state he should envy. If you've ever known parents who have lost young children, understand this, or if you've done, had that experience yourself, okay? To have so soon escaped worlds and fleshes, if no other misery, yet age. So the state that he should envy could be fatherhood, but it could also be the state which is heaven. And what has he escaped? The world's and flesh's rage. Hamlet sins, uh, slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. And if no other age. Johnson, by the time he publishes this in 1616, is getting a little up in years. But even not considering that, he is 31 when he writes the poem in 1603, okay? Believe me, most early 20s, you'll understand this a little bit better when you get to 31. Just wait till you're 51, okay? So, peace, and ask, say, here doth lie Ben Johnson, his best piece of poetry. What does that mean? Here doth lie Ben Johnson's best piece of poetry. He's not talking about writing the poem and burying it. His son is his best piece of poetry. Because what is poetry? It comes from a Greek word, poesis, which simply means a poem is simply something made. We say, however, that a poem is something made of words. And it has meter and rhythm and rhyme and such. If it's good poetry, if it's ugly, modern, really has none of that stuff. So, and usually doesn't make any sense either. So he says his son is his best creation. For whose sake henceforth all his vows be such as what he loves may never like too much. What he loves may never like too much goes back to line two. My sin was too much hope of thee, loved boy. Is he saying his son died because of his sin? No. And what do parents often hope for their children? Success. What else? How, what kind of success? success? Better than what they had themselves. As I said, Johnson was the son of a bricklayer. No matter what he did in his life, he could never escape that. He wanted to not be the son of a bricklayer. He wanted his son to be the son of Ben Johnson, the playwright, the author, the writer. Okay? Huge difference. Huge, huge difference. So what he's saying is, I put so much hope in you. As if God then were to say, mm, putting your hope in the wrong person. Okay? Now, go from there to page 589 in mind, to the memory of my beloved, the author, Mr. William Shakespeare, and what he hath left us. 
This is printed in folio, which is published in 1623. Okay. It's the first collected edition of Shakespeare's plays. Notice, Johnson writes this big, long poem for Shakespeare. Johnson was a contemporary of Shakespeare's. They, they were not only contemporaries, they were, um, what's the word? Competitors. Competitor play. And all you have to do is read any play by Shakespeare and read any play by Johnson's, and you see why more people go and see Shakespeare's plays today and not Johnson's. Probably wouldn't have written this, knowing what little I know of Johnson if Shakespeare hadn't really written the plays. But he does write this. Now, since we're running out of time, about the first 20 lines of this, first 18 lines of this, are essentially prologue. They're not really what Johnson wants to say. What Johnson really wants to say begins actually at line 17. So I'm going to skip the early part. Soul of the age. What does he mean by that? Well, the age is a sphere. And Shakespeare is the guiding intelligence. After all, what do we call this period? We call it either the Elizabethan period or the Shakespearean period. Okay? The applause, delight, the wonder of our stage, my Shakespeare rise like he's calling him up from the dead I will not lodge thee by Chaucer or Spencer or Bid Beaumont there is Poets Corner in Westminster Abbey he's saying I'm not going to go to Poets Corner and say can we move this over a little bit Shakespeare in there and by the way if you ever get to go to Poets Corner in Westminster Abbey crammed is the right word you cannot go in there without stepping on somebody and having monuments all over the walls and such. So, he says, Thou art without a tomb, and art alive still, while thy book doth live, and have, we have which to read, and praise to give. Shakespeare will never die, as long as his words are still in print. And, we have wits That I not mix thee so, my brain excuses. That is, I'm not going to mix you with Beaumont and Fletcher, a couple of years in Shakespeare's day. I mean with great but disproportioned muses. For if I thought my judgment were of years, I should commit thee surely with thy peers. If I thought that it would be right to say that any judgment of you would be determined by time frame, he says, no, I would put you with your peers. And tell how far thou didst our Lily outshine. John Lily wrote a bunch of stuff nobody reads today, except for in graduate courses. Okay? We're sporting kid, Thomas Kidd. Again, very few people read his material. Marlowe's Mighty Line. Now, more people read Marlowe and even still see some of Marlowe's plays. And though thou had small and less Greek. And this is a line a lot of anti-Shakespeare people say, look, if he had small Latin and less Greek, he wouldn't have written some of the plays he did. No, 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 no. What Johnson means is you have small Latin and less Greek compared to me, Ben Johnson. Okay. Now, what kind of Latin and Greek would Shakespeare have had? And we'll stop at this and we'll pick up with this on Thursday, on Tuesday. What kind of Latin and Greek would Shakespeare have had? He probably would have started grammar school in Stratford around the age of seven, and he would have left around or 13. The grammar school, by eight or nine, all the teaching would have been conducted in Latin and Okay? Conducted in Latin and Greek. So he'd have to understand Latin and Greek in order to understand schoolmaster. And the practice would be, once they mastered the rudiments of Latin, they would get something like Caesar's Gallic Wars. 
or Virgil's The Aeneid. And they would have a passage in Latin that they would have to translate into English. And then that would get checked. And then they'd have to take their translation of the Latin into English. They'd have to take their English translation and translate it back into Latin without having the original in front of them. And it had to match perfectly. You get that good old medieval renaissance up to the 19th century wrap across the knuckles. So imagine what kind of Latin and Greek he would have had by 12 or 13. It would be the equivalent of today's college classics major. Somebody who starts studying Latin and Greek as a freshman and graduates four or five years later and knows Latin and Greek. Okay? Shakespeare would have had that by 12. Johnson would be like today's classics professor who sleeps in dreams in Latin and Greek. So when he says, yeah, he has a little Latin and less Greek, that's compared to me, you know, Mr. Know-it-all in Latin and Greek, okay? All right, we'll pick up there on Tuesday. Remember, your papers are due Tuesday.